Uh, welcome back for another video lecture for Math 141 Statistics at Morton College. Once again, I am your instructor, Dr. Scott Spaniel. Uh, and today we're going to talk about section 9.2. Um, so this is going to be very similar to section 9.1, uh, where we were finding confidence intervals for the population proportion. Uh, but this time we're going to do the same idea, but for the population mean. Now, the biggest difference off the top for these is that in um, when we're talking about the po um, population mean and the sample mean, we don't know what sigma is. We know what S is um, for the standard deviation. And so this, if you remember back to chapter three, sigma and S have slightly different values because of degrees of freedom. And so we're going to be looking at um, using a curve called the student's T distribution, which is very similar to but slightly different than uh, the normal curve. Um, now, the nice thing for you guys is we're going to be using class calc once again to do these calculations. So for the most part, uh, you don't need to know why or how this works exactly. Um, but you do need to know that it's different and that when you're going into your calculator um, to find the correct interval uh, calculator, you want to make sure you're using T instead of Z. So you don't want to use things with Z's, which stands for the standard normal curve. You want to be using things with T, which stands for the student's T distribution. So let's go ahead and get started. So you can take out your note sheets, uh, which can be found on Blackboard or in my math lab, and turn to page six uh, in the chapter nine notes. So we calculate T in a very similar way to how we calculate Z, which is we take the data value minus the mean, and we divide it by um, the standard deviation. So in this case, that's S. Uh, we're going to do S over the square root of N which is very similar to how you would do this for the population uh, on the normal curve, which is what we looked at in chapter eight, because remember Z is X minus mu over sigma divided by the square root of N. Okay, so they're fairly similar, but remember S is always a little bit bigger than sigma. So this is gonna be a little bit wider. And so I'll just go down here to this picture at the bottom. Notice the blue curve that ends up on top here is our normal curve. Um, and then the ones underneath are the students. So they, they have slightly larger dis, um, standard deviations, so they're more spread out. And the, clo the bigger your sample size gets, the closer it gets to the population, so the closer to normal it will become. So let's talk about this T-curve a little bit. So um, it's different for different degrees of freedom, right? Unlike the normal curve, which is the same um, for any sample size. Uh, the T-distribution is still centered at zero and symmetric about... Um, and symmetric about Sorry. Yes, centered at zero and symmetric about zero. The area in the curve is still one because this is a population distribution, right? So the area of the whole thing is always one. And so half the area is on each side at one half. And the T uh, increases without bound, the graph approaches, but never equals zero. And that happens in both directions. Um, the area in the tails of the T distribution is a little greater than the area in the tails of the standard normal distribution because we are using S as an estimate for sigma, thereby introducing further variability into the T statistic. As the sample size N increases, the density curve of T gets closer to the standard normal density curve. This result occurs because of the sample size increases. The values of S get closer to the value of sigma by the law of large numbers. So that's a lot of detail about the T-curve that you don't need to memorize or anything like that, but I do want you to be aware that we are dealing with something that is very similar to, but slightly different than the standard normal curve that we've used so far in chapters 8 and 9. Well, and 7, for that matter, as well. So, let's go ahead and look at how this works. So, if I were dealing with a problem where I wanted to make a confidence interval around a mean, I'm going to make this work very, very similarly to um, what we've been looking at previously. Um, so a Gallup poll of 547 adult Americans employed full or part-time conducted August 13th to the 16th, 2007, asked how much time in minutes do you spend commuting to and from work in a typical day? Survey results indicated that the mean was 445.6 minutes and the standard deviation was 31.4 minutes. Construct and interpret a 90% confidence interval for the mean commute time of adult Americans employed full or part-time. Okay, So, 
to do this, we're going to go into class calc in a very similar way to how we would do it um, in any other situ in uh, section 9.1. We're going to go into stat, test, and then you just have to pick the appropriate um, thing from this list. So like I said, we're using the T distribution and we want to make an interval. So that leads us to using the T int. Okay. And notice it's asking for the mean, the standard deviation, the sample size, and the confidence level. So fairly similar um, to what we did in the last section, except um, we're going to be um, we need to put in a, a few extra things. So the T interval is what we're doing in this case. So in this case, our mean was 45.6. Okay, our standard deviation is 31.4. We uh, have a sample size of 547 adults. And our confidence level is 0.9. Okay, and then it gives us our confidence intervals right here. We've got our... Um, this is degrees of freedom, which for the most part, you don't need to worry about. We've got our margin of error and we've got our data values there. So this one is, um, we go from 43.4 minutes to an upper bound of 47.8 minutes. So in section 9.1, all of these inter, uh, intervals were about percentages or proportions. Here, they're all going to have data values because they're around a mean. Okay, so it would look something like this, all written out in your note sheets. Okay. Is it possible that the mean commute time is less than 40 minutes? We talked about this in the last section. It's possible, right? Because these are not infallible. Uh, you can definitely have values that don't fall within them in your intervals, is it likely? No, right? It's not likely because um, you're talking about, there's a, you're 90% confident that this, that it's in this region here between 43.4 minutes and 47.8 minutes. Okay. So that's the idea. Um, one thing I didn't mention, I don't think on the previous page that I should mention is remember in order to use this thing, the T curve, just like with the normal distribution, we need to make sure that our sample sizes are large enough. In this case, that means that n needs to be greater than or equal to 30, which in this case is not a problem at all. Okay. One other thing to mention before I have you guys try some of these, notice there's an option for data. We'll talk about how to use that in a few minutes. But um, right now, when you're given a mean, a standard and a, sta a mean and a standard deviation, you're being given statistics, so you want to use stats. Okay. So that's the idea. So go ahead and flip over to page 8, pause the video for a moment, and try these two. Try putting this information into class calc. Oh, sorry. I'm on. On page eight, try these two, putting the information into class calc, and then when you hit play, we'll go over them together. Okay. So the first one says, a Gallup poll conducted May 20th to 22nd, 2005, asked 1,006 Americans during the past year about how many books, either hardcover or paperback, did you read either all or part of the way through? Results of the survey indicated that the mean was 13.4 with a standard deviation of 16.6. Construct a 99% confidence interval for the mean number of books Americans read either all or part of the way through during the preceding year. Interpret the interval. Okay. So um, the way this one would look is we do a T interval, right? We know we're doing a T interval because we're given mean and standard deviation. And we're going to put in the mean, the standard deviation, the number of people in the sample size, and the confidence level. So that's what I'm going to put into class calc. And if you want, you can just type it in, right? You can go find it. But if I start typing in, in fact, if I type in T int, it brings it up. So then we put in 13.4, 16.6, 1,006, and 0.99. And we get... Our confidence interval of 12.0 books to 14.8 books. Okay, so that's the idea.
Then the second one says, well, they did the same survey back in 1978. So you're going to do exactly the same idea, right? This should be T interval. T interval. 18.8 comma 19.8 comma 1006 comma 0.99. Okay, and so in this case we get 17.2 books to 20.4 books. Okay. And one of the things I haven't mentioned quite yet um, is how to interpret these things. And I, the key here is that we are, um, you are this level of confident that the per, uh, parameter is in this these intervals. So for example, in this case, I could say I'm 99% confident that the number of books read either all the way or partway through uh, in the preceding year by Americans is between 12 and 14.8 books. And then at the bottom here, they're just asking us to make a conclusion based on the two results we got. So compare the results of the previous questions. Were Americans reading more in 1978 than in 2005? So as we mentioned in the previous section, when your confidence intervals overlap, you cannot make conclusions that one is larger than the other. But in this case, the interval from 1978 is bigger than the interval, completely bigger than the interval from 2005. So we can conclude that, yes, Americans were reading more. Sorry, that's hard. I didn't write that very nicely, but uh, that's the idea here, okay? So all of these examples are one with ones with very, very large sample sizes where we're given the statistics, right? That's kind of the deal. But as you may notice, because ClassCalc has an option to do data for these, there is a way to do these problems using data. So let's go ahead and look at that. So all this data is in your uh, note sheet uh, data sets. Uh, for these next couple problems. So the first one says, a researcher asked a random sample of 32 adults, how many days per week do you participate in exercise activities? The results are shown. Construct and interpret a 95% confidence interval for the mean number of days per week in which adults engaged in exercise. So first question is, is my sample size large enough? And it is, right? 32 is larger than 30. So I can do a confidence interval here, right? Because my sample size is large enough. So what we want to do is we want to put our data into class calc, just like we always do. So from either the homework or from uh, a Google Sheet, copy and paste the um, data into another entry point in um, class calc. Now, there is a little bit of a glitch in this that I have mentioned in class. If you're in one of my classes that we have virtual sessions this semester, that if I delete this first one and then put in a different name, it got rid of that first data point. But that doesn't actually matter. It's still there. You just can't see it. I've played around with this a little bit. And I'm pretty sure of that. So now all I have to do is put in A for where is my list. And then the second thing I put in here is my confidence level, so 0.95. And then it'll give me my confidence interval which is 2.19 to 3.81. So we are 95% um, confident that the number of days that Americans participate in exercise each week is between 2.19 and 3.8 a week. Okay, so that's all there really is to that. And just to show you that that answer doesn't change, let's go ahead and try it if I get rid of that and let's put in the data like this to show you the little glitch shouldn't affect my answer. Yeah, and I get exactly the same answer. 2.19 to 3.81. So the number's still there, you just can't see anymore. So if you do want to change this name like we've been doing in the other videos, you can. Now, okay, so that's the idea for that. So we get 2.19 to 3.81. Now for the next one, we run into a problem. 
Notice there is um, only one, two, three, four, five, 14 answers here, which is not big enough, which they actually tell me right there. So my n is not greater than or equal to 30. So what I need to do is make sure that this is approximately normal using two things. Okay, we're gonna use a normal probability plot, which is what this is here for, and we'll talk about that in a second. And we're gonna use, which we talked about in section 7.3, uh, and then we're also going to need to do a box plot to check for outliers, which we talked about in section 3.5. So if you want more detailed um, on how to do either of the two things we're about to do, those are the sections you should go back uh, and look at. Okay. So let's go ahead and do this one. So once again, my data, I typed it out into this sheet. So let me copy and paste it into my graphing calculator. Okay. And so we want to make two graphs. We need to do a normal probability plot, which is under stat, uh, distribution and plot, and then it's the last one here, normal probability plot, and I'm just going to tell it to graph x sub 1, okay? And then I also want to do a box plot, so I can get that by going to stat, distribution and plot, and then choosing box plot. And once again, I'm going to tell it to do x sub 1 for my list. And now if I zoom in, on my normal probability plot, it looks like this, but the more important thing for me is this value here, this R. So my R for my normal, prob normal probability plot is 0 0.992, okay? So we'll talk about what to do with that in a second, but 0 0.992, and then I wanna zoom in on my box plot, and with the box plot, I just wanna make sure there aren't any outliers. And since we don't see any asterisks, we have no outliers. So from the this, there are no outliers. Okay, so those are the things we're checking for. We want to check for no outliers is the first thing. Okay, so that works. No outliers, check. And then from the box plot. Then for this, what we need to do is we need to grab the value that corresponds to our sample size, which is 14. And what we need is we need our R value to be greater than the critical value. Okay, so in this case, our R value is 0.992, which is indeed greater than 0.935. So that checks out. So once those two things both check out, we can do our T interval. Okay, so now what we want to do is go in here and just type in a T interval. So T interval with data, tell it to look at X sub one, and that we're doing a 95% confidence interval. And so in the end, our confidence interval here is 17.1 um, dollars. So let's round that off to the nearest cent. So $17.11 to, or wait, is it percentage? Nope, sorry, it's percentages. 17.1% to 20.3%. There's our answer. Okay, so that's going to be the most complicated of these problems, is one where you have to find, uh, where you have to use data and you don't have a large enough sample to assume normality. Okay. And so that's it uh, for this section. So in the last section we're going to cover from Chapter 9, uh, we'll call, do Chapter 9.4, uh, Section 9.4, where we'll do... Um, putting it all together where you basically will put these two types of T intervals um, together and you have to decide which one to use and we'll talk about how to make that decision. So if you have any questions, as always, free free to email me or send me a remind message uh, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Other than that, make sure you're doing your homework uh, and we'll see you next time for video for section 9.4.